You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we are on. And today's guest, we've got Sammy the Bill. Sammy, how are we? Uh, a pleasure being here. And uh, I think it's going to be a great interview because he's got a heavy accent. I have a hex- heavy uh, Brooklyn accent. It's going to be a little weird, but I think I'm gonna, we're going to enjoy this. So no one will know what the fuck we're saying, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but first and foremost, it's good to have you on. Uh, I've came all the way to Arizona. Uh, everybody knows the kind of true crime, and you're the biggest name out there, so... For giving me the time and letting me come to your place and interview you, listen, I appreciate that. My my pleasure, it really is. You're a gentleman, and I know a lot about you, and uh, it was my pleasure to have you on board. Thank you. Before we get into everything, no, Sammy, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get more about understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Okay. So shoot away with your questions, and uh, you know, it all started when I was a kid. I was born and raised in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, so it all started over there. Um, I grew up real quick. I was dyslexic as a kid. School wasn't for me. I joined the gang early in life. Stood there for uh, quite a while. Bunch of guys, it was us against the world, all that bullshit, but there we knew there was a mafia and we knew to avoid them. They were a little dangerous. And uh, and then uh, when I was 19 years old, I got drafted into the military during the Vietnam War. And uh, I went in, I served two years. I got out with an honorable discharge. I think it was the first thing I did in my life that was considered a good thing. So, uh, and I enjoyed it. I was in good shape, it didn't bother me at all. I never went to Vietnam. I was stationed in the United States. So when it was time to me get out, I got out. And as soon as I got back, it seemed like I joined the Rampers right away again, the gang. But um, it seemed like everybody hooked up with somebody, whether it was the Colombo family, Gambino, Genovese, you know, different families. So uh, a friend of mine, Tommy Spiro, his uncle was Shorty Spiro, who was a legend with Carmine Persico, and uh, he told me he wanted to talk to me. And he said, you're a pretty tough kid, Sam. He says, you're a good kid. Uh, you're going to raise your hands once or twice to somebody you shouldn't, and you're going to get killed. But if you're with us, you're with a family, uh, we'll protect you in a way, and you could be with us. And, you know, we're never going to ask you to do something that we wouldn't do, that I wouldn't do myself. And so, so I knew what that meant. As far as killing people and stuff, that's what they do. And I shook his hand, and I uh, became an associate in the Colombo family. How was your mom and dad, Sammy? They were good. My father, they were legitimate people. My father was a painter. My mother was a seamstress. Um, They came here from Italy, Sicily. My father actually was an illegal alien. He went into Canada. He jumped ship, snuck over the border. It took years before he became a citizen, but... um, We had a great great family life. I had a brother and a sister who died before I was born. Um, Those days you caught pneumonia or you got sick real bad. The medicine wasn't good, you died. And then later on I had uh, another sister, an older sister. She was nine years older than me and one that was five years older than me. And then in 1945, I was born. And uh, I think it was right after the Second World War ended I think they were worried. I was born. They said, "Let me let's end this fucking war." This guy is born, so <laughs> not not knowing that you were going to start wars later on in life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of wars. See, when you were dyslexic at school, Sammy, did you feel like an outsider? Yeah, you know, I was like literally abused. You know, they didn't know what dyslexia was back then, so they thought you were either stupid or retarded. They thought so, all these things about you. I got along good with the little girls, and but the boys would break my chops, laugh and goof on me and stuff. And that's what started my fighting. I started fighting, and uh, I didn't like it. And so 
come three o'clock, school was over, I would break somebody's ass for it. That's why they would stop uh, teasing me. Uh, and it, it worked. How much does that mold you as a person? Because every gangster I've interviewed, every murderer, every drug lord, every bank robber, every single one was either bullied or abused when they were younger. Yeah. I, I wasn't physically abused because I was a pretty strong kid, you know. And I was actually a little bit older than them because I got left back in the fourth grade and then again in the seventh grade in junior high school. So I was actually a little bit older than them. So they didn't want to uh, bully me. They didn't try that but because uh, I was two years older than them. You know, when you're a kid, 10 years old and then 12 years old, it's a big difference. Uh -huh. um, so I didn't get bullied that way. It was just that... Uh, they would laugh because I couldn't spell a word, an easy teasing. word. Teasing? Yeah, teasing you and stuff like that, and that embarrassed me in front of the girls, and, and I resented that. Uh -huh. So I kind of stopped that real quick. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I think I was 12, 10 years old. Uh, my father and mother, they were humble people. They were broke, not a lot of money. Um, and they bought me a nice bike, a swing bike. Top of the line, it was expensive. And my father told me, take care of this bike. And uh, I did. And one day I went to the corner store and I left the bike outside, was buying something. When I came out, it was gone. And I was sick. Because I knew they couldn't afford to buy me another bike and he told me to take care of it. A couple of days, maybe a week later, my friends saw me and they said, Sammy, your bike is down the block near the fruit and vegetable store. And I ran down there to get it. There was two kids who were a little older than me. One was, if I was 10, he was 12. The other one was 13. And I started fighting for my bike. I wanted the bike back. I wasn't giving it up. That was my bike. And I was fighting like crazy. Across the street, there was a bar where all these mafioso guys would hang out, shooting crap in the street. Cop cars never bothered them, you know. And one guy came across, he knew who my father and mother were, and uh, he said, what's your name? I said, Sammy. So he intervened in the thing, he grabbed the two bigger kids. He said, this is his bike, they say it was theirs. He said, go get your father to come here. And if it's yours, you can get it. But if it's not yours, but they were, and they stole it. They weren't gonna get their father, they took off. And one of the other guys from across the street yelled, what's going on over there? He said, this kid, Sammy, he says, uh, Jerry and Kay's son he was fighting for his bike uh, for older kids. You see the way he was fighting? He was fighting. He was like a little bull. That name stuck, Sammy the Bull, forever. Later on in life, when cops were looking for me or something, they would come, where's Sammy the Bull? So, and even till today, newspapers, books, articles, it never stopped. I didn't like it in the beginning, but I got used to it. See, when you were going through your upbringing, did your mum and dad, was there telltale signs that you were becoming aggressive, angry, or was everything kind of suppressed? Well, they knew that I was like a bad kid growing up, and I was fighting a lot. Um, but they were always, you know, you're their son, they were always, you know, giving you the benefit of the doubt or something. You know, it happened when I was in uh, junior high school, uh, I went to school one day. I got caught playing hooky. And the truant officer caught us, brought us into the principal's office. And they were talking. And uh, the principal said something about grease balls. These grease balls, meaning Italian people, it's a slow word. These grease balls, that's how they are. They're always in trouble. It didn't bother me when he called me a grease ball. It didn't really bother me all that much. But later in the conversation, he said, you know, he, I'm referring to my mother and father. These grease balls are animals. And I got up and I said, listen, listen, my mother and father are good people. Now you're talking about, my, you're not talking about me, you're talking about my mother and father. So I said, they're good people, honest people. Um, I don't like the way you're talking. Sit the fuck down. And then he turned to the teacher again. This is the principal. He said, see, this is how these grease balls are. I cracked him with fucking shot with everything I had, and I broke his jaw. I went to the Board of Education. I was thrown out of that school. It was shallow junior high, 
and I was shipped to uh, McKinley Junior High, which was in another neighborhood, mostly Irish people, Polish, different pe people, not the Italians anymore. And uh, I had a lot of trouble in that school because, again, I was getting along with the girls real good. The guys resented that. And there was always an argument, and I was quick to fight. Like I said, I was a little bit older than them, so I wasn't easy to bully. And uh, and that happened, and at night I would go back to my guys, my friends, the rapists, and tell them what happened. And they said, where, where are they hanging out? There was a car park, McKinley Park, right across the street from the school. They would hang out there at night. So we would get cars, stolen cars, we would pull up there with bats and pipes and beat the shit out of them. Just so they didn't jump me again in school, you know? And uh, so all of that start, you know, escalated in those ways. So violence back in my time was a relatively everyday thing. Normal. It was normal, you so know. Why did you join the military? Was it because you knew it? it could have possibly saved your life by giving you some discipline, or was it just a case of trying to get off the streets? Yeah, I didn't join. I was drafted. So you were drafted? Back in those days, there was a draft. You didn't have a choice. They called you, they drafted you into the military, and they took you. So I was drafted. If you joined, it was three years. If you got drafted, it was two years. I got drafted. I did the two years. I trained to go to Vietnam, but I never went. I was trained how to kill, what to do. Uh, I went down to, I think it was Louisiana. There's all swamps in Louisiana. So they did all this jungle training in Louisiana. So I trained for all that stuff, but I never went. They, you know, not everybody goes. So some certain units didn't go, certain units did go. My unit didn't go. Was that a big part of who you ended up becoming? by the training you got in the military with using guns and being calmer to then become who you were? I guess, you know, being trained, before that I never killed anybody. So I guess, you know, and then the government feeds you the bullshit that these people are communists, they're going to come here, they're going to rape your mother, kill your father, rape your sisters. So you're being trained in a way where mentally and physically you're, you're going to kill these people. Because you think the worst of them. It was all lies. It was all bullshit. They're not bad people. Yeah, you're being groomed. You're being groomed. So I guess part of that stuck with me a little bit. But I don't want to blame it on the, the military. I got along really good in there. I had a lot of friends in there. We were all in the same boat, you know, under pressure training and getting ready to go. So it really wasn't that, but I trained and got ready for it, and I came out of the military, like I said, I went into the mafia and uh, the Colombo family, and that's where I got my first hit. What was it like being, because everything you've done, you've kind of been surrounded with friends, military, gangsters, you've always had people around you, was that always the case? Did you always need people around you, like a brotherhood or friends? I was comfortable in that environment. I'm not intimidated by a tough guy. You look like a tough guy. You're well built, you look like a strong guy. I'm not intimidated. I actually absolutely like that. You know, I'm comfortable with men who are men, who act like men, talk like men, conduct themselves like men. I'm not afraid of that. I'm afraid of these kids today. If there's a war, those kids are going to go fight. Those kids are going to protect us, the country. I don't get along with them. Uh, today, guys want to wear a dress. They're a girl. They're a guy. They don't even know what the fuck they are. I'm intimidated by that. I don't like that. But I'm very comfortable with tough guys. Mm. I don't have a problem with that. I never did. Uh, I don't need them to surround me. I can protect myself. I fought in the ring. I fought all my life in the street. Uh, I was in the mafia. I was in gangs. So I don't really, I'm not, I'm not very fearful of things, you know. Uh, a lot of guys, one guy asked me, he says, well, you're not afraid? I'm afraid of some things. I saw that picture of Jaws, and I'm afraid of fucking going in the water. 
when I go into water, I go up to my ankles. I'm looking now like my computer was last <laughs> So yeah. everybody has fears, but I'm not afraid of men, men's men, guys who are men. Uh, I feel they're the same as me, whether they're bigger, stronger, tougher. I'm comfortable with them. Did you know that then? Because some of the maddest and most ruthless people on this planet, they don't. It's not as if they're cage fighters or boxers, but they have a presence, an aura. Did you know that when people walked into a room that, okay, he could, he's he's got something? Well, I mean, I, I looked up to people who were, who were legends and, and did a lot of work, mafiosos. So had like Shorty Spiro or Kame Persico or Joe Colombo, people names like that. I had Joe Bonanno. I had a lot of respect for them. I looked up to them. I didn't fear them. I knew not to play stupid games with them. You know, they were tough people, dangerous people. But they were easy for me to talk to or be comfortable around. So, and I, I, I just didn't look at them in any which way. Now, I loved my father and looked up to him. He was a legitimate guy, a painter. And uh, my mother was a seamstress, so they were hardworking people. We never had no money, so, I mean, everything, they worked a ton of hours to support me and my sisters and stuff like that. So I, I think I was fairly neutral to the whole thing. You know, if you didn't fuck with me, I wouldn't fuck with you. I didn't walk in and didn't try to walk around like a big shot. I, had, I never did that. Um, I think I was a little too short for that. Why did you always gravitate towards the top end, the top scale, and like the top boys of anything you've done? Why was that? Because you you walked with a bit of confidence yourself, and you never kissed ass. Like how how did you end up gravitating towards like the top ends? Obviously, there's different levels, but you always seem to have went to the top end. You seem to have manipulated it. But we're all manipulators. We all talk shit, I believe, anyway, in life, but you seem to have, it was like a chess game for you. Your interviews I've listened to, it seemed to have, you knew exactly what you were doing and who to get in contact with to then not elevate you, but it was like, if people, I under, I'm a man of frequencies and energies and how people, you can sense something, but you always seem to gravitate towards the people who were the most dangerous, the more ruthless, the more powerful. Was that a plan in your mind? Does it just not happen naturally? Yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I never gravitated. I never went up in looking at for a promotion or going up. I was part of their group. It wasn't my choice to go and get made. It wasn't my choice to become an acting captain or a captain or eventually the underboss of the family. I never even thought of those things. That That wasn't in my thought. And it wasn't me who went into those areas. When I was asked to become a, a made guy, um, they came to me. I didn't go to them and ask to become a made guy. They made those decisions. It was the way I conducted myself my whole life. Other people up on top, it's, it's no different than a company or a corporation. If you're out, an outstanding, I'll call it employee, employee, and you're making moves that help the company. There's a boss up on top who will look at you and say, um, this guy's pretty good. And he's going to promote you to a manager or assistant manager or whatever the thing is. It's not your intention necessarily if you're just doing your job. But you're doing it so well that it's noticeable by other people. And I think that was me. I never had the intention, I think that, when I had that dyslexic, I never th dreamt that I could go higher. I just wanted to be fit in, like in the military. I fit in with people, and I was good at it. When we went jogging, I ran. When we went on maneuvers, I was good. When we shot a rifle, I did hunting and fishing as a kid. I was good at it. I didn't try to be better than everybody or to try and become a sergeant or a captain or something in the military. I was a private when I went in, and I came out of corporal, a little step above. Uh, I never made sergeant. I never wanted to make sergeant. Never even thought about it. Uh, when I was gonna, the two, my two years was up and I was gonna leave, even in the military, they came to me and told me, you're a good soldier. 
would you want to join up now and for another two years or three years? And I said, no. Now, I, I could have elevated and joined, but I never looked at getting higher. When I did do something, I want to do it as good as I could do it. I did the same thing when I did a podcast. I'm not trying to be the best, um, but I opened it up. I didn't understand it, and I started working with it. When I first started doing podcasts, I got out of prison. I did 18 years straight, just about 17 years, seven months. And uh, my son told me about social media, and I started with social media. Uh, it was just talking to a microphone, no video, no music, no nothing, just talking. And I said, uh, why don't we video it? I was working with a guy named James Carroll. And uh, he said, well, because they don't podcast, they just talk. So what's the difference if we video it? And he said, we could do that. And we did it. And it was extremely successful. And he told me, I think it was him, is it, you want me to add some, because he was a great editor. You want me to add some music to it? Yeah. Liven it up. And we did that. And it worked perfect. And right now I got over 112 million views on my podcast. I got almost 600,000 subscribers. So... It worked. Now, I'm not trying. I never thought that I could be the best. Um, I thought I could do it. Um, I, should, I did a, a movie where I acted in the movie. Um, the Salvatore was the name of it. Now, I never acted in my life. And he said, you know, we'll call it the Salvatore. You could play a part in it. Now, I, I'm, I'm not an actor. I don't think I could be an actor. But I tried it. I did it. So I'm that type of person. I think I'll try anything once. If I like it, I'll continue doing it. If I don't like it, I won't do it. Huh. I tried to sing one time, and somebody said, listen, don't change your job. <laughs> <laughs> don't quit your job. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I can't sing. But, uh, you know, I that's my personality. Um, now I do podcasts, and, and now I'm doing stuff, stuff in Hollywood. Um, and if you would have told me five, six, seven, eight, ten years ago, whatever it was, you're going to be in social media, talking publicly, or doing acting, or being in Hollywood, I would tell you crazy. Me? I So I don't even look at these things. I, I, I kind of stumble into them. And if you give me something to try, I'll I'll do it. You know, I got in a ring with a couple of times. There was a guy, he says, he says Sammy, we're going to, you know, I was sparring, not, I never did it professionally. And one day there was going to be a regular fight. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I looked across the ring and there was this tall black guy, very muscular. And I said, holy shit, what the fuck am I doing? This guy's going to cripple me. But I had to go in and try it. It's just my personality. And I got in. And I was getting beat up, but I just kept fighting. The fight was over. I lost it on a decision, but the guy came over to me, and he said, Sammy, I give you a lot of credit, bro. I hit you shots. You should have went down. You just don't give a fuck. You just keep fighting. And I think that's my personality. You want to beat me? All right. You could beat me. You're physically stronger, bigger, taller. Knock my ass out. But at the end of the fight, you may win, but you're going to have a lot of respect for me. But, you know, And that happens if you notice guys in the ring, they lose, they hug each other because they respect the guy's ability to fight back, even though he lost. And that's me. I, if I lose, I can care less. It's the same as bullies. Bullies don't want to be hit. And as soon as you start hitting them back, they become fearful because they're getting free hits. That's why they want to bully. It's the same as this day in society. There's kids should be taught combat sports you, you learn a lot more under pressure you learn a lot more getting hit understanding you're not made of glass and this is why the world is becoming soft like people need to even I don't agree with people, kids being having to go through the military I believe all war is murder but it's just kids need we're still fucking men we're hunters we're experiment hunters we should be learning to be outdoors everybody's now technology mobile phones becoming fucking soft wearing dresses 
we're forgetting ourselves. And if you speak out against this as well, you just become a homophobe or you're transphobic or whatever it is. But people are allowed an opinion. Men are men. There's two genders, male, female. Men can have babies. Men can have a period. And that's just basic science. It's you know, chromosomes. And I feel as if the world can be confused as well. But like you say, learning and pushing through the pain, it makes you stronger towards life and understanding life ain't that bad. Right. And I respect anybody that has a fight and has a tear up because it takes balls. And anybody that stands their ground, knowing that they're going to get beat, have got bigger balls than the man who wins because they've showed heart. And that's just what I'm saying. The guy, you're going to have respect for the guy. He couldn't beat you, but he tried his best, stood up, he took his beat, and he's... I mean, you have respect for him. Even though you won, you know, you have respect for him, and that's exactly right. I agree with your whole theory there, um, is that, you know, we're men. I was grown, grown up. I went hunting with my, my brother-in-laws and people, took me hunting as a kid, fishing, uh, just all manly things. I respect men. Um, I respect women too, on on a very high level. Uh, and you're never going to see a real legitimate tough guy beating up a woman, beating up his wife. Or they don't do that. You, a, a jerk does that. Uh huh. And uh, you know, like when they're no match for us physically. So what are you trying to prove when you hit her, slap her, punch her? Or, it just don't make any sense to me. But there's being a man, uh, we talked a little while ago about uh, Andrew uh, Tate. Uh, I don't agree with everything he says and does, but I most of it I do. I mean, I would love to talk to him too. I'd love to do an interview with him. I Him and his brother, they're both good guys. Uh, I really uh, I enjoy a lot of things they do. Same with you. Listen, I know about you a little bit of a history and you're physically, you're a man's man. And I'm comfortable when I said, you know, would you do the interview? Yes. Yes, because I respect you. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's the same as toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity doesn't even exist because if you're masculine, you're not toxic. You're a leader. You're strong. There's two. There's feminine energy and there's masculine energy. Men and women need each other. We both need each other. For me, women are the center of the universe. Women are stronger than men. The way a woman carries a baby, the way they can, the baby gets fed through this, the umbilical cord, and the way the woman's body changes and the energy that changes. And I mean, a man gets a flu, and we think we're fucking dying. You know what I'm saying? Like, is but like men are, women are strong. Men build the world, but a man will do anything in life if he loves the woman that he's with. He will do anything. That's a strong man. And. No matter how what level you're at in life, if you're providing for your family, you're a masculine man. It doesn't matter what you do, how much money you make. If you're providing and feeding your family, you're winning in my eyes. But again, society tries to change the way we think and the way we feel. They try to make women masculine. They try to make men feminine. And listen, by all means, be who the fuck you want to be. Be gay, be straight, be trans. I don't care, but just keep it away from my kids. Keep it away from me. Just let me do my thing. I'm not harming anybody. I travel the world just me and Stephen interviewing amazing people, understanding their life. Uh, we're not doing harm. I speak the way I want to speak, but I'm not harming anybody. You can't give me an opinion on something that I should believe in when I know it's not quite right. I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time, but I'm fucking man enough to go, okay, I fucked up there, but, and that's life. No, I think, uh, I think you're 100% right. I mean, there, there's, there's no question about it. I think you're right, 100%. I think that way too, and I think everybody has a right to be what they want to be. I have some gay people in my family. I'm not against them. But if that's what you want to be, be it. Be it to keep it to yourself and yeah. enjoy your life. And What's up? I deal with a lot of people in Hollywood that are gay. I think they're great people. I think they're smart. They're very uh, creative people, a lot of them. So, uh, but you see, a lot of people nowadays are making big deals out of it to try to you know, change it. You know, I, well, I know years and years ago when I was a kid growing up, I would watch movies. A ship would go down and it was always save the women and the children. No more now. Yeah. No more now. The guy who wants to the front of the boat, <laughs> get, get me out of here. Save, save, save myself. Fuck everybody else. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. So, and, I mean, I don't agree with that whole thing. If people agree with it, that's fine with them. But masculinity and being a man, I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I love women. I mean, I love women. Listen, when I was cheating in school and I couldn't do my homework and I couldn't do this and I, 
I never cheated or forgot a guy to look at his papers. I would always look at some girl sitting next to me. I would look at her papers because they were smarter than us. <laughs> they were yeah. smarter yeah. all the way around. So I have a lot of respect for them. I got women on my crew, on my team, and uh, they're great, as you could see. That's what I'm saying. Male, female, just be who you want to be. But we're in the gayest generation that there's ever been. One in five people. But like I say, I don't care if you're straight, bi, be who you want to be. But just, I feel as if men just be a bit, need to be a bit more about the masculine yeah. energy. Yeah, exercise. Be what you Look are. after yourself. You can. You don't need to have to be in the best shape. I love my food, but I still exercise. I still box. I still run. I still feel I can handle myself. And that's what it's all about. You've got to provide and protect and and this is what it should be. Seeing you joined the Colombo family, what did your mum say? Did she know? No, no, she didn't know. She would be against it. I mean, they they wanted a better life for me. You know, they came from Sicily. You know, they were in Sicily. They were broke. They're farmers and they're pe peasants. So they came to this country looking for a better life. So they wanted a better life for me. Go to school. Go to college. That was out. I I couldn't do it. Um, being dyslexic, I I couldn't do it. But um, they always stuck by me. Or every time I was in trouble, they were there. The the love never diminished. I think it got stronger. It strained them a little bit. I saw the pain in their face every time I was arrested or in trouble. Um, but they always loved me as uh, as a person, and uh, that was important to me. Um, and it broke my heart. It you know seeing the 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 strain it put on them. Hurt me more than a beating. I could take a beating right away. <laughs> I fought. I did a million things. So if they hit me with, you know, something, uh, my mother would hit me with a, with a mop, with a broom, you know, because that's what moms do. They want, you know, you to stop doing the wrong thing. And so, but my father never even raised his hands to me. Always loved me. Always was there for me. Um, always provided. I mean, he would work 12 hours a day. We would eat dinner, and he would go back to the factory. They, were, they had a dress factory for a while. Uh, they had all these women working, making clothes, women's clothes. And he would go back, you know, get ready for the delivery the next day. A lot of times I would go with him, and I would uh, put the plastic over the dresses because the delivery guy was going to pick them up the next morning, so he needed help. I would go in on occasion, and... Um, so uh, I, I, you know, I had a lot of good training, a lot of good love from home, and I think that helped me through. Why do you think you went down that route then of being a serious criminal and a hitman and everything you were involved in if you had that understanding? Because it's not as if you're a psych... Anybody who wants to be a gangster is psychotic anyway. They are fucking nutcases because it's not a sane thing to do. It's, but you had that... It's not as if you're emotionally cold where you're totally blocked off and don't have feelings and emotions, you understand that you were letting your mum down every time you went to prison or got to jail. So why do you think you fully went? Because it's clear you're a family man as well, but why do you think you made those choices? Yeah, to... I'll tell you why. I, I'll tell you why. My neighborhood was saturated with the mafia everywhere. So we looked up to them. You know, a lot of times your mother and father will tell you what to do, but you, you wear it smart. Nah, they were old. I appreciate it, but you don't listen. Who you listen to is your environment, the people you grow up, your friends. If they're all going in that area, you follow them more than, your mother can't pull you away from that unless she lives in a different neighborhood. So my neighborhood was a rough neighborhood. I dealt with a lot of, and had a lot of guys who was an Irish mob too. And I dealt with a lot of Irish guys who were really tough too. I could ask them the same question. So they come from Ireland or they come from places where England was suppressing the Irish and they got the IRA and they fought back. They were underground people and they grew up tough. It was instilled in them from what their environment was. I have a friend of mine who's Turk, this guy Max, he owns a restaurant, great guy, but he's tough and he's a chef got a restaurant, great guy, do your favors, left and right. But he grew up in Turkey where it was tough, tough neighborhoods, wars that broke out, and people fought. 
that environment has something to do with it. So me, I, there, we, this country had a lot of wars. The Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War. You got a lot of men who will have, pick up that environment that comes from governments and something that becomes instilled in you. If I would have went to Vietnam, I would have killed a lot of people because the government is telling me how bad they are, what they're going to do to this country. Government bullshitted me. I never met a bad Vietnamese person. I was never in prison with one, uh, and I never met a bad Vietnamese person. So whatever they were telling me was bullshit. So you grow up, part of you is instilled with your family. So I think what they instilled in me, it made me a gangster, not what they're teaching the neighborhood was, but I was a different kind of gangster. I did have compassion as a gangster. A little bit more than some guys were ruthless in the mafia. I wasn't ruthless. Even though I was involved in a lot of murders, stuff like that, I never killed an innocent man, woman, or a child. I killed on orders like like in the military. Of you broke the rules and you were supposed to go, and I had your contract, you were gonna go. But other than that, you couldn't get me to kill a kid or a woman. I tell a lot of guys when they have a fight with their wife or this or that, I like to smack, no, no, push her away. She's coming at me, run away. If nobody thinks you're not a man, you're just trying to avoid that conflict with her. You don't want to hurt her. So she gets over aggressive and she attacks you, run away, get away from me. And, uh, and that doesn't mean you're not a man. It means you're more of a man. You're not intimidated. You don't have to put out an act and beat her up to, to be a man. So it's your environment does more than anything else. So I think it made me a little bit. I still had my mother and father's teaching. I respected them. I loved them till today, always. I, I don't have nothing bad to say about them. I never did. I don't know anything bad about them. But uh, And I grew that way. But that made me a different type of person. Now, I could have came out of prison. I got over 22 years in prison. I have uh, almost 23 years in prison in my life. Um, I was involved in three mafia wars, 19 murders. I could have came out and been an animal. I think this part of me is my mother and father. When I talk about doing an interview with you, I have respect. I have what they taught me, not what the mafia taught me. I've evolved, but there is a certain part of you in your life when you're growing up with your friends. You know, I looked at areas like uh, uh, different states, Oklahoma, places like that. Everybody goes to college. And I said, what do they eat in Oklahoma or Montana that they all go to college? Why? Because they all go to the mall they all hang out together, and all the kids talk and whatever, and they're all going to go to school and go to college. The dumbest kid grows up. He wants to go to college, or, or she, because their friends are all going. Throw up to the environment. It's the environment. The environment, actually, in my opinion, has more of what you're about. You come from another country your family. That's instilled in you. Everything you just said, it's instilled. It's coming from the other side. It's not growing up. These kids are growing up all fucked up because they go to colleges and in the colleges and the universities today, that I would they're teaching them garbage. Kids are coming out of college in this country, hating this country. Because you're either white, you're a racist, or you're a homophobic, or you're this, or you're that, or you're the other thing. Growing up, I never heard all that shit. I mean, I heard the thing racist, but homophobic, I don't, I don't, there was gay people there. Nobody gave a shit, one way or another, whatever you were. So it's your environment has a, an, a tremendous impact on what you are. Now, your mother and father does too, but it's a secondary thing. When you become a bad boy, 
I'll call it that. Sometimes you may think, I'm going to hurt this guy almost for no reason. Maybe we could just argue. Maybe I won't hurt him. Maybe don't call for that. Maybe it'll be just an argument. In some cases, some kids come out of a bad family and then join the mafia. Then they don't have no other schooling. They, they become more violent because they have bad family upbringing. Friends were bad, and they're topping the whole thing. They're, they're getting even worse. So I think the environment has a tremendous impact. Like I said, I knew a lot, a lot of Irish guys. I was in prison with guys who, uh, a guy, uh, fuck was his name now? I forget his name. What sort of stuff are you doing with the Colombo family? Uh, you would get a contract, go beat this guy up. I got, I'll give you one example. I was with Carmine Persico and Shorty Spiro. Shorty Spiro told me, he says, Carmine wants to talk to you. I was young, and I was with them. I wasn't a maid guy. I was an associate. So I went down, and he was talking to me about beating some guy up. The guy was banging somebody's wife who shouldn't happen, and he says, I want you to give him a good beating. I said, okay. He says, then take his ear off and bring it back to me. I said, okay. And I got in the car with Shorty and was leaving. I said, uh, I don't have nothing. You know, I could give this guy a beating, meet another guy. He really wants me to take his ear off, bro. For real? That's what he said. So they were vi very violent. I'll give you another example. When I was transferred over to the Gambino family, um, and I was put with this guy, Todd Olorello. He was a captain, very powerful. And uh, he made me sit with him all the time. And one day he said, he would sit in the backyard, he had fruit and trees, fig trees, you name it. And he would sit out there and smoke a cigar. And he said, I want you to sit with me one day. I got a guy coming in. Okay. He said, keep your mouth shut. Just listen. All right. The guy came in and he gave this whole argument about his friend. He thought he was, she, he was making a pitch to the wife and trying to get with the wife. The wife denied it. So Tato told him, all right, don't do nothing. Go away and I'll call you in another day or two. He called the other guy in. The guy was in almost in tears. He says, I told the woman she's a good woman. I said, you're a beautiful woman, inside and out. He had a tremendous respect for her. He didn't try to make her. He didn't try to take her to bed. And he loved his friend. It was misunderstood. He let him leave. He said, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. He said, uh, if you were me now, what would you do? Get a couple of young guys like me, a couple of thugs, and we'll give his friend for trying to fuck around with his wife a beating. He said, good, I know you got balls, and now I know you're stupid, and it hurt me. I love this guy. And he says, come back tomorrow. I'm going to have both of them here. Sit. Both of them came in. It really was a big misunderstanding. Both of them were literally hugging each other, literally in tears. The wife said it wasn't, he never did anything. This guy took it the wrong way. That you're beautiful inside and out. So they left. He said, what would you do now? I said, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but you, right away, you would have gave that guy a beat for nothing. You would have hit him for not. He would have went into the hospital for no fucking reason other than you wanted to jump the gun. If you want to sit in my chair someday, you have to listen what Bodhi is. 
either somebody's lying, the truth is in the middle, or it's a misunderstanding. Before you make a decision to do something, understand the whole thing fully. You didn't understand the whole thing. You heard one guy's story and you were willing to give the other guy beaten. And that taught me a lot. It was different than the Colombo family. This guy was using his head. He says, it's not that we can't use violence, but we use that as a last resort. Not the first thing. So there was different teaching in Colombo. Beat him up, shoot him, kill him, cut his ear off. These guys, more business, unions, making money, more compassion. And it's not that they couldn't kill. Pulling the trigger, whether it's a Colombo family or the Gambino family, you're dead. It's just how they look at it. And that taught me a lot, too. So between my mother and father's teaching and Carl, uh, Tato's teaching, I became a different kind of a gangster. I wasn't straight out violent. I could be, but I'm not basically a violent person. I actually like people. I'm a people's person. I joke with people all the time. I love playing with them. When the guy came in, I said, we got the same barber. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and then when I said, if I don't understand your vocabulary, sometimes you have a heavy accent, I'll I'll joke with you, I'll tell you, what'd you call me? Or what'd you say? Some bullshit like that. I enjoy people from different nationalities, different races, different religions. And I don't go by a lot of the things that people teach. I like people. I can see if I don't like you as a person, I wouldn't give a fuck if you were white, black, yellow, Asian, Mexican, Spanish, Swedish, Irish. I don't care what you are. I don't like you if I, as a person, not for all those labels oh. of any of those labels. Did you think you had that then? Because everything's a gift. <laughs> if you give someone a compliment or if you crack a joke, it makes people feel relaxed. Did you have that as a personality walking into a room with these so-called killers and psychopaths to make them feel at ease? Where because if you make someone feel relaxed, same as interviews, they'll tell you a better story because they're more, they're not tensed up. Right. Did you sense that you had that little gift? Well, I, I always told jokes. But in the beginning, I told jokes because I was hurt. I was embarrassed in school. So I became the, a clown to tell a joke. You have people laugh rather than laugh right at the you. joke yeah. rather than laughing at my not being able to spell uh -huh. um, or do certain things. Everything looked different. Now, now, going into dyslexic, let me explain. Maybe some of the people don't even understand what that is. A person, one uh, psychologist, gave me a piece of paper to read, a small print, and um, I grabbed it and I looked at it, and, and she said, uh, what do you think? I said, I, I, I don't understand it. What do you mean, you don't understand it? I said, do you have a blank piece of paper? She gave me a piece of paper and a pencil. And I scribbled on it. And I said, here, take this. She looked at it. And I said, tell me what that, you know, what's about. She says, I don't have the slightest idea. It's just scribbling. Well, that's what that paper you gave me that's what that looks like to me. My B's look like a D. Uh, I, I eight looks like a three. I don't. I can't visually. It's a dyslexia. It is a visual thing. Not really a brain thing. I think it's more visual. Now, every time when a teacher would say, "What's that number?" I would say three. Everybody would laugh. Sammy, that's not a th three. That's an eight. I was wrong so many times that I started, what's that number? And I would look at it. To me, it looked like a three. But I knew I was wrong so many times that I would just say, even though I didn't think it was, it's an eight. Yeah, that's right. I learned how to cheat the system. 
I was embarrassed to say I, when I was young, Dave, the, they don't look like it. A tree looks like an eight. I think you're crazy. But I knew it was me who was crazy because when I, when I say an eight, it's, an, it's a tree, everybody's laughing at me. So I know I'm wrong. I don't know why. It took a while to understand. And it's the same thing with writing. And, and, and when you're dyslexic, comprehension is hard. So I could read something and not remember the whole story. So you may be able to read it and say, this is a story about this boy and girl, Jack and Jill went up a hill to get a pail of water. When I read it, I don't know what they went up there for. I don't know what the hell's going on. So it's hard for me to kind of, you know, comprehend what the story is. How does someone get transferred from one mafia family to another? Would that not be a red flag? Because the information you had about one family, you could have took it to another family. But how does that work? Is that a one-off or is it something that happens That's quite a lot? Perfect. That's a perfect thing that don't normally ever happen because you know their secrets. I went one time, it's a whole long story, so I, I won't tell the whole story, but I went to kill Shorty's brother. He did something to, to me. Uh, about me, um, and I went to kill him. The Colombo family found out that I went with a gun. I, I didn't get him, but I was going to kill him. And uh, they wanted to break us up, but they thought I was 100% right. You were right to want to kill him for what he did, but you went to his fucking house and knocked on the door his wife answered the door. If he came to the door, were you going to kill him? Yeah. And you were going to kill him right in front of his wife, fucking wife and kids. Yeah, I was that hot. Well, that's wrong, Sammy. That's where you went wrong. If you would have killed him in the fucking street, we would have patted you on the back. You were right. But you went to his house and it's wrong. We can't kill him, even though we know he's wrong, what he did, because he's short his brother. So somebody, a guy named Johnny Rizzo, who was a made guy in the family, went to Tato, and it went up to Carlo Gambino. The heads of the families talked about this situation. Um, the Columbos didn't want to kill me. The Gambinos didn't want to see me get killed. So they made a deal. We'll transfer him. He'll no longer be with us. He did work with us, meaning he killed with us. He was in our war with us. We trust him and we like him. We'll release him with no restrictions. If you want to make him a made guy or whatever you want to do with him, that's fine. We're not intimidated. We don't think he's going to hurt us or give up any secrets or do anything. I was transferred under those conditions. And that's when the Gambinos accepted me. And from that day on, I was with Tyrell. And I always, when they transferred me, one of the head guys in the Colombo, uh, Carmine Persico's brother, Alley Boy Persico Sr., grabbed me, hugged me, gave me a kiss on the cheek, and said, Sammy, you're always going to be our friend. But we wanted you to promise one thing, you won't kill Ralph. And, uh, that's, and you'll always be our friend. I promised I wouldn't kill Ralph. I never did. I shook his hand, and I went with the other family. That's their decision. It's not me. I don't have no part in the say in that. But you're happy with that? Because it seems crazy that gangsters are getting transferred to other families. It's not gangsters. Me. Yeah. It didn't so, happen. So you were it wasn't the a normal thing. Yeah. It happened a couple of times, but it's not gangsters are getting transferred. It don't happen. They, if they're chased, if we don't want them with us, then it could happen. And usually another pyramid won't even pick you up because if you got chased, they don't want you. Uh -huh. But in my case, it wasn't about that being chased, number one. And number two, it wasn't an everyday thing that happened. Yeah. I know you speak about you were involved in 19 murders, and I don't want to mention names because I don't want to go down the same route as every other interview, but I don't want to upset people as well but your first murder that you done I've spoke to a lot of killers 
And a lot of them were nervous. 99% of them were nervous. You weren't. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe fighting, maybe all the things, maybe being trained in the in the military. Uh, I don't know. I, I question that myself, to myself. When, uh, and I said it a bunch of times, I watched movies, guy kills somebody who's going to kill him, he kills him, and he's sweating, he's scared, he's nervous, he's this, he's that. I expected that to happen. I did the murder. Um, I was done, we cleaned, got rid of the gun, cleaned the car, did this, did that, did everything. And I went to a apartment where me and my friends were staying, took a shower, and waited for that to happen to me. It didn't happen. I got dried off. I went to bed. I slept like a baby. The next morning, I woke up. Little girls were up in the place, and, oh, my God, they killed Joe Colucci, and this and that, and it was in the paper. And I remember asking one of the girls, do they know who did it? She said, no, they were investigating it, but no, they don't know. And then they went to the corner to hang out. I came a little bit later. And when I walked there, I was there, standing right there. But I almost had like an out-of-body experience. I felt like I was way above them, listening. And they didn't see me, and, but I was able to see them. It was a weird feeling. Um, and what took me out of that feeling is that Shorty Spiller had pulled up, got his nephew Tommy, get Sammy, come my person go wants to see him. And I came out of it. Shorty said, listen, don't explain what happened. You did a good piece of work last night. Let my nephew tell Carmine, because he was on the hit, too. Explain to him what exactly happened. You be quiet. I didn't say a word. He explained the whole thing. And we got in Carmine Persico, grabbed me, hugged me, kissed me on the cheek. He did a good piece of work. Patted me on the back, so to speak. And I left. And it always bothered me. Why didn't that stuff I saw in the movie, why didn't it bother me? Um... The only thing I could come up with, maybe I was just a natural born killer. Like I said, when I went in the military and I would have went to Vietnam, I would have killed. I had no hesitation about fighting for my country, protecting my family. This is, and now I was protecting Gozen Ostra. It was a different type of army. Maybe that's it. I don't know what it is. But I never... I had that feeling, and I don't know why. Because we talk about being a product of your environment. Do you think you always had that something in you? You would have been involved in that some sort of violence or killings no matter where you grew up? Well, my whole neighborhood, there was killings all the time. But even if you weren't, do you think you still had something that's maybe ingrained from past generations or whatever it is to then gravitate towards being, like you say, a natural-born killer? You would have killed in the, the Vietnam, you'd have killed in the mafia. Do you think you would have always you had something inside you where this we I don't went know to? a person in my family, grandmothers, grandfathers, sisters. I never knew my brother because he died before I was born. Uh that was dangerous or criminal. Not not a one. My mother wouldn't kill anything. I don't think she would step on an ant. Um, my father was from Sicily. He was a tough man, but not a not a violent man. So I don't know of anything as far as her heritage. And I don't really get into that because I think that psychologists, psychiatrists, that when they look into your past, they look into this. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know. I know kids who grew up that I hung out with um, were great kids. Flew pigeons together, played sports together, and wound up in the mafia and 
were pretty deadly themselves. Now, I've never known any past with them um, or their families that I know. I might not go back in their family, but I don't know what it is. I think it's the environment, again, that you grow in. Like I said about Max or some IRA guys, um, they grow up in an environment where there's violence. You go now to Israel and uh, cer certain countries that are fighting with them. I forget their names, Houthis or whatever they are. They're fighting. They're killing. For different reasons. I won't even talk about their reasons because I don't care. But you think that there's going to be six, seven, 10, 12 year old kids that are not hearing this, seeing it, feeling it. Some of those kids aren't going to grow up violent. If that's what you believe, you're crazy. Did you enjoy killing Sammy? No. 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 I was very efficient at it. I was very good at it. I used to use my head. I planned things. I'm, 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 I'm a meticulous planner. Calculated. Let's say I was going to kill you. Argument's sake. I would know everything about you. If you're married, who's your wife? Who's your kids? Where do you live? Where do you work? Where'd you go to school? Everything about you. You want to come to a meeting today with Sammy the Bull? What time? And I found the best place in the world to kill you. And when I did plan, you were dead. There was no way to escape me. People would say in the street at one time, if Sammy's got your head, you're fucking dead. That became that I was a minute. I planned it so carefully before I did something. I wasn't just going to shoot from a car like some guys do. Oh, that's thuggerish stuff. Um, I was a planner. And as a planner, I would not, not rush. I would plan your death. How long would that take to plan a murder? Not long at all. And I, it's, it's not only killing you. It's, I'm going to get away with it. I'm going to have an alibi. The team that's on it, they're going to get away. Nobody's going to get caught. So it was, I was planning it as it, a lot of stages, but it didn't take long. It depends on who you are. If I knew you, it didn't take long at all. I knew all, all of your traits, all of everything you do. You go, you're married. You cheat on your wife, and you go to your girlfriend's house every Tuesday, 8 o'clock. I'm not going to kill you in your girlfriend's house, but when you come out, I know your car. I see where it's parked. How hard is it for me to kill you? The hardest thing now is pulling the trigger. Not for a hit guy. So you're dead. Did you ever miss? Um, I missed a couple of times on, on purpose, but I, I never really missed. I missed where a couple of times guys get a, got away. Very rare. Because I interviewed an SAS man, and he says the majority of people who hold guns, it says 90% of them miss because they're all shaky or they turn their head up. Those ain't hit guys. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. A lot, But a lot of mafia guys aren't. I thought every mafia guy was a trigger man until I started speaking to people and understanding they're not. Is uh, because that, that he says because a lot of people turn their head in cars outside houses. You were, you seem to do it more cold, calculated. Yes. Where you are ruthless with it. Right, and I'm not trying to be ruthless. I'm trying to do you a fucking favor. I don't want to bang you all over the place and we're punching you and kicking you and stabbing you and this. I don't want all that for you. I'm gonna hit you a fucking shot right in your head. You won't even know what the fuck happened. You will feel no pain. You will die instantly, and as far as that's, I'm not ruthless like who wants to just bang you around and do all that bullshit. I'm not into that. 
I'm a stone cold killer as far as I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to make you suffer. Um, there's no reason for me to do that. That is that. Because as a murderer, you talk, you talk about, and it kind of gets you emotional. Because then it, you seem like the perfect soldier for someone. If somebody's a boss, you you seem like the perfect guy you would want working with you. You'd follow orders. You'd do everything 100% of your ability. I think anybody with some sort of brains would see that and understand that. But the guy who you says was like a samurai, he died with pride, he died with honour, he took off his shoes. But why did that affect you, someone who's a killer, who basically can take lives without batting an eyelid, go to sleep the next day, wake up and eat his breakfast as if everything was fine? Why does the guy who wanted his shoes off when you killed him affect you? An hour or some time before he's going to die. We talked. He was in that van with me for, you're talking about Johnny Keys. He was in that van with me for 12 hours and talked to me about a lot of things. And uh, I won't go into all of them. I'm, I'm not allowed. I'm going to do, there's going to be a movie made about it. So I'm, all, I'm, I'm limited on what I could say. But let's talk about the shoes. He asked for some favors and I conceded because he acted like a man under pressure to any favor he asked me. Uh, then he asked me to not be found with his shoes. I couldn't understand that, and I asked him why. He said, my wife is stupid. She knows there's a war. She knows who I am and what I am. And I always comfort her and tell her, don't worry about it, I'll die with my shoes off. Ultimately meaning, I'll be home with my shoes off, I'll die normal, don't worry, I'm not gonna die in the street. If I'm found without my shoes, she will know that in my last thoughts, I was thinking of her. And that blew my mind. 69, 70 year old man, wants to send a message to his wife to comfort her that he was thinking of her in the last minutes of his life. I thought that was about as honorable as you can get. It was a love story at that point to me between a man and his wife. And... Uh, I agreed, and that's how he was found. And uh, what I said about everything with him is that he taught me goes in Austria in a whole different way, a whole different light. He taught me how to die like a man. No whining, no struggling, no nothing. Somebody had told me, well, a guy named Nick Pelleggi told me that, you know what you two were? What? Samurais. A samurai knows when he lost and wants to die with honor. That's what he was doing. An old girlfriend of mine told me recently, not too long ago anyway, um, when you grew up here, I had beautiful blue eyes and happy eyes. You always used to joke and laugh and talk. We broke up. I haven't seen her for years. And uh, then she came across me. She said, you know, I bumped into you once and your eyes changed. How? They were cold as ice. You changed. Something happened, you changed. I said, uh, when do you think that happened? She said, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. I think 1980 maybe. 
And 1980 was the Johnny Keys hit. So she may have bumped into me weeks or months after that and said I changed. I became hardcore. My eyes were fucking not happy eyes anymore. So that's environment that's growing in an environment that changes you. It's not your mother, not your father, not your grandfathers. I was never sexually molested. I was never had all these bullshit things that some people have. Never. It was my environment I was growing in. Do you think killing someone does something to the soul? When you talk about the, the eyes changing, the cold as ice, it is the seat of the soul. The eyes tell a lot, Sammy. And do you feel now... Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but everything that you know now, do you feel as if it does something to a man when you take another life? Oh, I think it does. I think it takes a hunk of his... I, I died with every hit I was on. A little bit of me. Not fully died. I A little bit of me died. There's something in The Godfather. Michael in The Godfather was talking in a room when he was taking over, and all these gangsters were there. The door was open and his wife was looking in. And some guy came over. One guy was kissing his hand. Another guy came over and closed the door. People, when they watched it, oh, they closed the door on his wife. No. The door closed on him. He became 100,000% because of Austria when that door closed. It closed on him to the rest of the world. That's what he was. The Johnny Keys hit, closed the door on me. I didn't have happy eyes no more. And I was cold as ice. And I was a fucking professional killer. I don't know about the soul. I'm not sure about that. Um, I believe in God, but I don't believe in a lot of religions. I think they're greedy selfish, and they teach a lot of bullshit. So I don't go by all of that religious stuff. To me, it's religious nonsense. But I do believe in God. Higher power? I believe in higher power, and it must be God that to created all these things, created a woman different than a man so she can have a baby. She can support life. She makes life. We need, she needs our seed, but she makes life. She feeds it. It grows in her body. And then she plants their feet on the ground through her, not us. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things I believe in, but I don't know about a soul. I don't know about whatever. I don't know if there's a heaven. I don't know if there's a hell. I don't know. I know I'll find out. Someday. I think we all get to a point, to an age, and we're all going to die. So we'll find out. I'm in no rush to find out. I'm in no rush for somebody to tell me about souls, about heaven, about hell, what I got to believe in, what I don't have to believe in, what I should think and what I shouldn't think. I believe there's a God. The skies, the trees, I do artwork. I look at the sky, the sunset, the sunrise, and I am an artist, a little bit of an artist. And I look up and I say, who can make this art? It is so beautiful. Who can make her have babies, make life, animals? Who, who can do all this? How did it all happen? Now, I don't know if there may be answers down the road. I don't know. Me, myself, I think there is a God, a higher belief, a something. Yeah, I'm the same. I believe all religion. Listen, if you believe in a religion that makes you a better person, by all means, that's amazing. But for me, it's divide and conquer. How can there be so many gods and so many religions? Right. Who's right? For me, there is a higher power as well. I don't mm. know what. I believe I am guided and protected. That's my own I belief. Don't I don't think could, it on yeah. my own. I don't just think it on my own. When I was in prison, I was with a group of Native American Indians for the reason I wanted to smoke. We weren't allowed to smoke, but they were allowed to 
past the pilot. Yeah. So I wanted to smoke, and I joined the group. But I got to understand their religion. It's a path to God, different path. A friend of mine was in uh, Wicca, the old religion of Wic Wiccans. And he said, you're not an Indian, and you're in that. Why don't you join us? We have classes, and I joined them. Some things I thought were a little weird, but some things, they had their own path. The Muslims have their own path. The Jews have their own path. The Christians have their own path. They all have paths to God. We're all killing each other and fighting over who's right and who's wrong. If you don't do this, if you don't believe in this. So I leave all of that out of my life. You could all fight about it, argue about it, believe what you want to believe. I'm cool with it. If it makes you a better person and makes you feel better, do it. I, if I pray, I pray directly to God. I leave the religions out. I think they all got a lot of money, make a lot of money. Uh, they do a lot of weird shit that they tell us not to do. No, don't be gay. There's a lot of priests who suck a dick. You know, kids yeah, and then a guy tells me, a priest will tell me, tell me your sins. No, fuck you. Tell me your sin. <laughs> <laughs> These fuckers have good more than anybody. I know, I know. So <laughs> I don't get into none of that. Yeah. I mean, I talk to you about it, but I don't get on a, on an everyday basis. I don't get into that. I believe in God. Yeah, but it's good to understand it. And like I say, this is your life story to understand who Sammy is. It's not anything else. Everybody sees the world differently. Right. I don't judge. I don't right. give a fuck what anybody's done because everybody's on different paths. Everybody's got different levels of trauma. Everybody's got different levels of upbringing. Because I've interviewed a woman, a man abused her sons. That woman went and got a knife and plugged the cunt, killed the guy, killed him. A woman, yeah, big heart. Any, anybody can snap, anybody's got it in them, anybody can kill, anybody can love. There's just certain circumstances in life, you never know how your cards are dealt. Right. How hard is it, Sammy, for a woman to be involved in that life? How hard? Because we talk about masculinity and provide and protect, but women seem to get the rough end of the stick with going out with someone who's in the mafia. How hard is it to keep a relationship? It, it, it is hard. They they got the rough end of the stick being married to guys like me or mafia dudes. It, it's not an easy life. And uh, they have to be really, really strong, put up with a lot of bullshit. Um, but by the same token, um, I got a divorce a long time ago. In 1981... I still uh, take care of my wife till today. She's sick. She has COPD. I take care of her. I will never stop taking care of her. If I had a girlfriend right now, I would hide it. Not that I have to. We're divorced. But I don't want her to feel hurt or the, you know, about it. So I, I, I always have those things in mind. And I think that makes me a, a different kind of gangster. But another gangster who don't give a fuck about how she feels. That's horrible. I mean, we, we cheat, we fuck around, we do a lot of things. But you, if you don't care about your woman or the women around you, whether they be on your team or your friend or your sister or somebody else, I mean, something's wrong with you, seriously wrong with you. You know, I'm talking about women protecting. A psychologist in prison asked me... Um, about killing and stuff like your ass could be, but a little bit more. She was a psychologist. And uh, I said, anybody could kill. And she said, no, I can't kill. So I said, can, uh, are you married? She says, I asked the questions. Then the interview was over. If I can't ask you a question, you're asking me questions and I'm answering. If you can't answer my simple question, then forget the, 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 the interview's over. It wasn't an interview, it was, you know, a psychologist talking. And she says, all right, yes, I am married. Do you have kids? A beautiful girl and a beautiful boy. Supposing somebody raped your beautiful little girl, brutally, brutally raped her and killed her, and got caught, and got the death penalty. Now the day is coming, they're going to put him to death. And nobody's there to press the button or pull the switch or whatever it is. And if nobody shows up, 
The death penalty sentence is commuted. He'll get 10 years, 15 years, so someday he'll go out. Could you pull the tra uh, the switch or press the button? Absolutely. She didn't even hesitate. So then under the right conditions, you can kill. Yeah. Under the right conditions, I can kill. And I think under the right conditions, anybody can kill. You get a lot of women, they're like the mama bear. Fuck with their kids in a horrible way. And if they can protect them by killing, they'll kill you. And so will a man to protect his wife and his children. I'm not saying they're going to be mafia people or they're going to kill ruthlessly or they but to protect their children, their family, they can kill. A soldier could kill to protect his country. A cop could kill to protect his people, the neighborhood. Some people break rules and are disgusting about it, but we're not talking about them. They're a small, small, small minority group. They become serial killers or whatever they are. That's a whole nother story but that I won't get into, but um, everybody could kill. How was your relationship with Castellano? It was very, very good in the beginning. I thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. I liked him. Um, I dealt with him a lot. A lot of union things and business things. He loved that about me, and he used me. Like you said before, you know, if you saw the way I was, you would use me. Well, I'm, that's how I'm involved in 19 murders. I never got up in the morning and felt like killing somebody. If I had an argument with you, I feel like punching your fucking face in, but I don't feel like killing you. But I was asked a lot of times under, Castel, under the Columbos, under the Castellano, under John Gotti. So I guess other people recognize my abilities as that. So they used me for that. But they also used me as a racketeer in business to control unions, jobs, making money, making deals. I'll give you, give you one more story. Is is Castellano sent me down to a meeting about the Concrete Club. It was bosses there, and he couldn't make. He sent me. I met the bosses, Fat Tony, Tony Ducks, a guy from the Colombo family representing them. Um. Fat Tony joked with me. You're a good-looking kid. What are you doing here with us old farts? Go out and go get laid, joking. Tony Ducks, Sammy, I know you're a little nervous. I was only an acting captain. They were bosses. Don't be nervous. When I look at you and we look at you now, we're looking at Paul. He sent you here. So would you say we're looking at you as a boss? Not that you're a boss, but we're thinking about him. All right. And I felt good. I heard the whole meeting about getting all the unions and trying to tie up the whole city of New York with the concrete industry and this, that, the other thing. So I got back from the meeting the next day and I sat with Paul and he says, uh, what'd you think? Tony and them, they were treating me great. Yeah, they're good guys. But what'd you think? You want to really hear what I think? Yeah, of course. That's why I sent you. I think we're all going to go to jail. It's too big. We're controlling too much. He said, good, good, good. I'm going to take you off representing this. I'm going to put somebody else doing that. I said, Paul, I'm not afraid to go to jail. I didn't mean it that way. I said, I'll, I'll be going to the meetings. He said, no, no, no. No, it's not. I'm not taking you off. I know you're not afraid. He said, you want to know what the other guy who was handling it before you, what he said? Yeah. What did he say? He said, great, Paul. We're going to make a ton of money. You gave me the right advice. We're going to go to jail. You're not looking at money and greed. You're looking at the reality that we're going to go to fucking jail because it's too fucking big. And I told him, Paul, then why don't you back away from it? He said, I can't. When the bosses of the other families are sitting at that table, I have to have a spot there. But I think you're right. And because you're so fucking right, I'm going to take you off for that. I don't want to jump in. I need you for other things, dealing with people. So I was not only picked to be a gangster and go kill somebody, I was also picked 
because I was able to use my head, my thinking power. And that may have made my job as a killer easier because I did the same exact thing. I used my head. I thought. I had not to, you, you want me to kill him? All right, I'll go do it. And I didn't do that. Oh, you want me to kill him? All right. And I did this whole investigation of it. Did you question, when someone gave you an order to kill, did you question why it was getting done before you done it, or did you just go and do no, it? No, in, in the mafia, if the boss tells you to kill, you kill. When you take the oath, the first question out of his mouth is, if we tell you to kill for the family, would you do it? Yes. He only ask you, you can't question the boss. If I tell you to go kill somebody, would you do it? Yes. And then they tell you a whole bunch of other things. But that was like the first question. Did you kill someone before his order once? Castellano? Or was it someone else? Did you kill someone? And you never got an order to do it, but you just you went and meet, met him, I think, and says, I've done it for your own benefit. I didn't want to come and see you and then kill someone. And then the heat would be on you. I did that with the Plaza Suite. Mm -hmm. I knew you know, the guy was so out of order. He did so many weird things. He did so many fucked up things. And then he took a machine gun out when me and my brother-in-law came in and put it right to my chest. It was close as me and you on. He pointed the machine gun. My whole body tensed it up because I thought any second he was going to pull the trigger. I thought I was getting killed. And uh, he should have killed me. But he didn't. But when I walked out of that office with him, I told my brother, well, get the guys, get my guys together. But Sammy, shut the fuck up, but Sammy. I told you get the guys and put them in the bar. I want to see them all. What are you going to do? I'm going to kill this guy tonight. And uh, we did that. And actually, Paul got mad at me because I didn't ask permission first, because you're supposed to ask permission first all the time. But there was beefs going on with this. That happened. I know his house was being watched. I figured if I go to his house, tell him what happened, he's going to say, okay, then I'm going to go and I'm going to kill him. And the cops, the agents will see me coming from where I was to his house and back. So if I'm caught, he's caught too. They'll have that. He's finished. So I took that into consideration. I talked to my very close friend, Frank Chico, told him everything that happened, bring it back to him. Even after the hit, I wouldn't go to his house because I didn't want, I know I was taking, already taking heat for that hit. So I said, Frank Chico. But Frankie came back, he said, Sammy, he's taking this the wrong way. He's taking it that you didn't, you know, you, you did it off the record hit. You didn't tell him. He stayed, I stayed 19 days. He wouldn't talk to me. I met my crew on the farm, on my farm, and I told them, listen, me and Louis Melito are in serious trouble, bro. What I want you guys in, I'm calling you guys to the farm where I want to talk to you. If I don't come home or something happens, take care of my fucking family. I want that I want you to see. I want to hear you say it. A couple of them said, Sammy, no, I'm not, I'm, we're coming with you. We'll fight. We can't fight. There's no fight. All I want you to do is take care of my fucking family. Give me your fucking word. They all gave me their word. Some of them left. Some of them left and came back. They just wouldn't leave me. So, and then 19 days later, he met with me and Louis Molito alone with Tommy Bellotti. And uh, just like I said in that other interview, he talked with us and he says, you know, and I told him, uh, I said, Paul, I did that because I thought, I knew you would give me permission for everything you did. And I just thought I would be bringing you heat, an immense heat. And he tried to protect you and leave you out of that. And, and I sent Frankie right away. I didn't try to dodge it. I didn't say I, I didn't try to say I didn't do it. I told you all the facts. And Tommy Bellani, who didn't really like me, or, or and vice versa, he kind of like shook his head like as if to say he's right. And then Paul said, okay, I'm, I'll let this go. But don't ever do it again. 
And I said, I can't. I, I, I can't say that. If it comes to me trying to protect you again, I would do the same thing. Louis Melito grabbed my leg and pressed it real hard. Paul looked at me, looked at Tommy Bellotti, and he went like this, like, he's right, in a way. He didn't say a word. He just shrugged his shoulders and nodded a little bit. And he looked at me, he said, Sammy, you got balls like a fucking elephant, bro. But you can't do this. I'm going to give you an order not to do it. And we left. That really broke up mine and Louis Melito's relationship. Why? Louis Melito told me, he said, Sammy, the same thing. You, 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 got, your ball, you got two bigger balls, bro. Do you become a threat then? No, no, no. He said, you got two bigger balls, you're going to get killed. Don't you understand? You can't talk to a boss like that. You should let you off the hook. Then you tell him, no, you're, gonna, you're not going to do that? What's fucking wrong with you, bro? You're going to get killed. And he looked at it like, me and Louie were like, Sammy and Louie. He didn't say Sammy without Louie. He didn't say Louie without Sammy. We grew up together. We were tight. We did work together. We did everything together. So he kind of thought, this guy's committing suicide. I love him, but he's committing suicide. And he broke away. And later on, when we were going to kill Paul, he made another couple of bad moves and whatever. But um, we that that meeting kind of broke us up. Why did so the guy that you had killed? He came. He was going to buy your nightclub off you, or the the building that it was in for a million quid. Why would he pull a gun out to you, knowing your history? And not use it. It's not as if it's going to be asking. I don't think attack. he knew my history that well. He came from Czechoslovakia. He was a fucking gangster in his own right, a drug dealer. He was a powerhouse in in uh, Czechoslovakia. I don't think he knew. He underestimated me. I think um, a lot of things. I don't know. But uh, we argued. There was a bunch of arguments. Um, there's something going on about that now. Um, people from Czechoslovakia talking to me about that whole thing. There was a guy who was at the party. They know the whole, whole thing going on. But, um, so I think he underestimated me. I don't think he, he knew I was somebody, but he, I, he, I think he completely underestimated me. What was it like getting made? It was the, one of the best days of my life. It, it, once I got to the point that I was in the mafia and I looked up to all these people, Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and on and on and on and on, and Tato and everybody else I was dealing with, um, it was it was if you were going to school and you weren't that good in the school and all of a sudden you got a little lucky, you went to college, and now all of a sudden you're in fucking Harvard and you getting your degree out of Harvard, it's got to be a fucking shining thing major thing that's what getting made was to me it was it was a highlight of my life I mean I had getting married was a highlight having children when each one was born was a highlight this was on that level maybe even above that is that how much it meant to you yes you see when you get made then what sort of doors does that open because We've not even touched on the business side of things. Like you were successful at business. You anything you done, you were successful at. But the business side of things, you made a lot of money. So see, when you become made, does it open doors for more business opportunities? Do you get more respect? How does it work? Oh, absolutely! It opens up all kinds of doors. You, as a made guy, you have the whole family, you have the whole mafia behind you. So if you're not a mafioso, let's say you're part of the Irish mob. And you're talking, you may be a tough guy with the Irish woman, but you say, this fucking guy's a main guy, which carries the weight of the whole mafia. You hurt him, you fuck with him, you do something, you could have the whole five families. It's not just him, and it's not just his crew, five, 10, 15, 20 guys. You got a couple thousand guys who will fucking kill you in a second because of what you did to him. So you're carrying the weight of the mafia, is, it's very heavy. They're so tight, and they treat their people, made guys, as they're all brothers there, like family members. Well, me and you get made. I'll, I'll make you a made guy. Um, 
your wife, I look at your wife now as my sister-in-law. Your children are my nieces and nephews. I could be in a bar one night and I could see a little daughter. She's drinking. Some guy's playing around. She's drinking a little too much. And I come over. I told the bartender, no more for her. Sweetheart, I know your dad. I know you don't know me. But you're going to get in the car. You're going to go home. The guy, you come here. Get the fuck out of here. Get away from her. That is my obligation. You're my brother, and she's my, you're my, your family is my family. Whether they know it or not, she may not even know me. You know, cry a little bit. Yeah, all right. Then go tell your daddy that I made you go home. You're getting in the car and you're going home. No, I'm not. If I got to drag you by your fucking hair and put you in a car, you're going home. You're a little drunk. This fucking kid is getting a little stupid with you. And that's got to stop. He's my boyfriend. I don't give a fuck who he is. You want to keep him as a boyfriend? Listen to what I'm telling you. So those are things that's automatic. When you see that or you understand and know that, when you fuck with me or my family, you're fucking with the whole mafia. Every family. When was the first time you met John Gotti? I met him uh, years ago. I met him in... In, uh, I believe it was 1976. I mean, yeah. I got made in 1976. I met, I, yeah, 1976. Um, a year later, I became an acting captain. He made me his acting captain a year after I got made. Um, I met John Gotti come out of prison. I think it was early 1977. He wasn't a made guy yet. He just got out of prison. And I met him in an after-hour club. Frankie the Chico had a, a club, which I always frequent. If he opened a gambling place or a club, I always went there with my people to, you know, always give him a push. Did you ever, ever have an inkling how much John would have a part in your life and how far it would went? Did you ever have a feeling, or was it just another normal man? Who no, made? it was just he wasn't even a made guy at that time. So you had made before John? Oh, yeah. He was, I was made in 76. He was made in 77. Ain't it mad though, Sammy? Obviously, sorry for asking the same questions, but it's just for the UK audience and fucking 40, 50 years later, we're still talking about it. Yeah, it is amazing. Isn't it? You know what's amazing? You could have you told me five, six, seven years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it is, you're going to be talking publicly about your life or about the mafia, or about, I would say, you're crazy. Me? I'm not a public speaker. You know, that's not what I do. I've never done that. So I, I would think if, you know, I, I got out of jail in 2017. I never thought of doing any of this. My son started telling me I was broke. Started on social media, started uh, doing some things. I said, what's social media? I had no idea. I was in jail for almost 18 years. There was no YouTube. There was no, these phones didn't exist when I went in. So the phones were brand new. I mean, it was always computers, but different kind of computers, the social media. I didn't know, have a clue what this was. What was it like being in prison for the first time in the 70s? Well, prison is a scummy place. I mean, there's nothing nice about it. What were you in for the first time? I was busted so many times I forgot what I'm what what was first or what was second. Yeah. But the the prison part of it, I think, when I testified, I mean, when I got arrested with John Gotti, I got arrested in uh, thou, uh, December of May uh, of ninety, nineteen ninety, with John Gotti. Um, I left him. I quit the mob and I left him in uh, November. Eleven months later, in. Um, 91, I did five years on that one. I got out. I went in the program a little while for eight months. Um, then I went back to uh, Arizona, where my family was. And then uh, in uh, February of uh, uh, 99, 1999, 
I got busted again. 18 years. And then I got a 20 year sentence. I did 17 years, seven months, just, mm-hmm. just about 18 years. And uh, so that was my, but I got busted as a kid and things, but I didn't go to prison. I went to regular jails, got out on bail eventually, and so on and so forth. And I beat cases and whatever. I lost right. any cases. See the Castellana killing? How planned was that? Mine. And because it's still spoke about to this day for a boss to be getting killed. But what what happened there? Why did that all come about? Well, he got him and Angelo Ruggiero, his guy, got caught on tapes, um, talking about the boss, talking about the commission, talking about drugs. And uh, Paul was going to wipe them out. And they came to me, and Fred Conchico, and Joe Piney, for help. And help meant going to war against Cat the boss. And at that time, Castellano was the boss of bosses. And uh, we decided to uh, save him, back him, make him the boss, me and Frank and Chico. Joe Piney K went along with it. DB went along with it. And that was us, and we were ready to have that war. How long would the plan to get Castellano killed? Took us anywhere between six and eight months before it happened. How many people knew that it was going to happen? A handful. Did um, you trust enough people with that information? Because you know yourself, if that gets out, you're dead. Yeah, without a doubt. Matter of fact, in October before the hit took place, me and Frankie Chico moved in together with another guy, Frankie Botts, a shooter. And we lived together in this guy Joe Watts's house. So we were moving around our normal routines just in case it did get out. But it was a, it was a small handful of guys. Because when Castellano got killed, was you were in the car around the corner and John Gotti was driving, is that correct? John Gotti was driving. We weren't around the corner. We were just down the block on the corner. So if you've set that up to kill the boss, why did you never become boss? Was that a tactic of yours? Because you seem, listening to you and listening to your interviews, you seem to move like a boss. Like you're sitting across from a boss and telling him, I'm still going to do it anyway. You've manipulated the boss to think you're doing him a favour, but yet you're still calling the shots. I don't think I manipulated him at all. I think I just told him what I felt as the truth. But if he lets anyone do things that he's not saying, then that's, for me, that's a weakness because you've found a flaw in his arsenal. Well, you could look at it however you want as a weakness. I think I took it as a strength Mm -hmm. that he was smart enough to see that I was right. I'm supposed to protect him with my life if I have to. And I think he took that as Tommy, who, like I said, wasn't one of my fans, nodded and as if to say Sammy's right. He's supposed to do that. You're going to punish him for what he's doing, right? He's trying to protect you. He didn't hide it from you. Now, if I would have hit it and said, no, I got nothing to do with that hit, and I did it, he would have killed me in a minute. But I didn't do that. And so... Have you ever been shot, Sammy? Twice. When? Two times when I was younger. Before the Mafia? Or in the mafia? Well, I was, I was, um, before the, it's actually before the mafia, but I was in gangs and stuff like that. So all the shit you had done in the mafia, you were never attacked, you were never shot, you were never stabbed? I was shot two different times and I was stabbed once in the army where they had a fight with somebody, you know, a guy stabbed me in the head. Um, and, uh, when we were kids, me and my friend Joe Vitale, we were going to the score. We both got shot. I got hit in the back of the head. The bullet was coming on an angle going this way. So when it hit me, it hit my skull, it kind of pushed it that little extra and it bounced off. It, it, it opened my skin, but it didn't crack my skull or go into my skull. It kind of deflected the bullet. The other one hit me in the chest. The, the bullet... When in my chest, it's split. I still have a piece of it 
in my muscle a lot. Uh, they never took it out. It was so close to my heart, the, the piece, the little piece where the bullet broke, that they didn't want to go in and do surgery on it. Then it became engulfed in my muscle. And uh, they never wanted to go back and open it up and do it. And it wasn't, it was, it can't move, it's in my muscle. And they just left it. A couple of times I went for x-rays, and they said, do you know, they thought I was in the military, do you know you got a piece of bullet in you? I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, leave it alone. I mean, yeah, I know it's there, so what? It's in the muscle. It's been there for, I don't know how many years, a ton, ton of years, so I just leave it. So see, when Castellano get killed, how does that then change everything? The boss of all bosses, many years later, people still talk about it, but how does that, did you ever think that you were next, or did you feel as if that was a new chapter to then make things happen differently? We wanted, me and Frankie and Gico convinced me that um, we were going to change the mafia back the way it's supposed to do, be, and save Gotti and his crew, and that we would make him be the boss. He had uh, personality, he had qualities that he could be the boss. Um, he just, and then Frankie told me, if he acts like a fool, we'll kill him, I'll take over, you'll be my hunter. And I shook Frankie's hand. At first, I didn't want to do it when Angelo asked me. I didn't grow up with John Gotti. He was a friend. He got made. We're friends. But I had no interest in killing him, the boss. Even though he did something to me and my family, which I'm not going to get into. But um, I didn't want to. I, and when we, he talked to me, I told Frankie, I'll, I'll do it. I'll be part of it. If you if you become the boss, Frankie was very he was like a big brother to me. He was fourteen years older than me. He was like a big brother to me. I loved the guy, trusted him. But he he convinced me that t saving them, taking it over, and me and him would be the power behind the throne. We put him as the king, and we would be the power behind the throne. Are you not become a liability then that you have killed a boss that you are not to be trusted or? Where he's feared, how does it work? How does it how does it operate? That you've killed the boss of all bosses, so obviously you have not fucking any control. Which I would be thinking that you can't trust them; they could put a bullet in anybody. So why were he's accepted to then do what he's done after the killing of the boss? Everybody was afraid of us. We were we were fucking dangerous. We had a fucking hundred shooters, and. uh if you would open your mouth in any fucking negative way about what we did, we would kill you too. We wouldn't even hesitate to kill you. We were at war. And guys knew that. They're not stupid. They said these guys are all shooters. And they killed the boss of bosses. They're fucking ruthless. You want to fuck with them and say something or do something? Or you want to be the fucking boss? So they just like, whoa. Yeah, all right. He's the boss. That's good. That's good. Then just back the fuck away. It, it literally terrified the entire mafia. It became worldwide news. You want to play with that? It's like the United States bombing fucking uh, Russia and blew it off the map. Do you think England's going to say something? or China, or anybody, they'll say fucking Trump was the president. They blew it off. Fuck that. I didn't get involved. That's a normal instinct. You would have to be crazy to say something or do something. You'd have to be out of your mind. So see, once, uh, see so, so when one Scotty becomes boss, how was life in the mafia then? Did you just feel untouchable? No. We didn't, never felt untouchable. Frankie the Chico got blown up in a car fucking five months later. Eight and he months. was your best friend? Yes. And he was he was the underboss. John became the boss. Frankie the Chico became the underboss. And who killed him? Well, there was a combination of different people, but it was Gas Pipe. It was Chin Gigante. It was people from Sicily. Now, that's my dog coming in. Well, it and she said... <laughs> And she's saying, that's the end of this interview, bro. <laughs> she's the one who keeps the time clock. 
<laughs> so who killed the chief? Was that ever a, an issue that it would be coming for you when your best friend get killed? No, no, no. It, it, was, it had nothing to do with that. Right. Right. So it had to, no. We were all going to. They were, of course, they wanted to kill us all. Right, mm -hmm. John, me, Frankie. You no, know, it wasn't easy. We had arms and guys around us all the time, and uh, you know, like it's dangerous to kill the boss because there could be a tremendous reaction to it. Killing one of us is the same thing. Uh -huh. You, you, you're taking on now everybody who was involved. That whole fucking. A large army of guys. So when did you become underboss? I became, immediately became a full-blown captain. Um, after that, I became the godzilla of the family. And I believe it was uh, 88, I became the underboss. So how long did you stay in power for before it all came crumbling down? How many years? Before John is pinched? Yeah, but yeah, before both you went... He's where we did the Castellano in December of 85. In December of 90, we're in jail. How was it seeing John Wuff in front of all the magazines and the news and it was a more glorified gangster? How was that? Was there ever, did you ever say, listen, you need to rein it in or was it just go, go to his head too much with the ego kicked in? Kicked in like a bastard. I mean, <laughs> he, did, he made every mistake. They did a thing on Netflix, How to Be a Boss, and Netflix, the people knocked the shit out. So he did everything wrong. Everything you're, you're not supposed to do, he did. That was on Netflix. They did another one now. Um, another one, I forgot the name of it. Uh, Get Gotti. They knocked the shit out of him. This is everybody. State, organized crime, feds, gang, ex gangs, this is everybody. So... He made every bad move you can make. Did Gotti give you an order to kill Don King? At one point, yeah. Why? Because he wouldn't listen to us. So being an underboss as well, though, did you ever quit? Because you should never have been on the streets killing, is that correct? Being an underboss? Well, when you get... You, to become main, you're usually a killer. You, that's how you get in. Mm -hmm. um, when you're main guy, you get work. When you're a captain... You usually, it's the guys who are not made yet, the guys who are made. It's not even the captain no more. Let alone the consigliere or the underboss. Then the, you got less and less that you're going to be on the street. He had me on the street as the underboss. On hits. Did you ever question that? That maybe he was I trying mean, to get you to get life or get killed yourself? No, I didn't, I didn't question it that way. I just, it was... Annoying. In other words, I shouldn't be on the fucking street as the underboss with a fucking gun, with a bunch of guys with guns, and I'm on the street. Bro, that's way below my level. Why am I still on the street? It annoyed me that way. I never thought he wanted it. He wanted to get done. So he wanted, when he wanted somebody dead, he wanted them dead. And his theory was, I'm going to bark, Sammy's going to bite. He knew if I had to hit, you would die. That That's what he wanted, that reputation. I give an order, that guy dies. Some of these guys, they, they're made guys. Not everybody's as tough as they, you think they are. They're soft. Even though they've been in the life and they got made, they're a little on the soft side. I wasn't. He knew I give him the hit, that thing's going to get done. When did you realize that it was all going to come on top? Did you get a heads up or was the indictments just, did it just all happen? No, no, no. There, we had worried there was indictments. I was on the lam for a while. Um, and then when I came off the lam, he called me in. We got pinched. What are you thinking then? Not that I knew we were in trouble, big trouble. And then they found out that uh, the apartment that he was in was bugged. And he had tapes on top of tapes on top of tapes. Now we knew we were dead. I don't understand that, Sammy, the, the speaking on the phone. What is that? Is that just... Not on the phone. He was in an apartment, but they bugged the, the, the apartment. When did you start listening to the tapes when he was speaking about you? In prison, yeah. What did they say? Well, they, they were holding us as a threat to society with no bail. 
and the lawyers put in that they can't fight their case. They're in jail. They're in a hole. And the judge went to the FBI and said, you know, they should have bail so that they could fight their case. And they said they're a threat to society. The judge says, show me. And they had to show the tapes. They played them in open court. The judge agreed and gave us no bail. But now we knew what, what he got caught saying on tapes. What did they say about you? And he was knocking the shit out of me. He was bear mounting me behind my back. How did that make you feel? Well, I'm not good. That's for shit sure. How would you feel? Yeah, but pissed off. Yeah. And most of it was bullshit. So it came out a little later, but, um, I mean, he had plans, I think, of getting rid of me. And, uh, he, yeah, that's a long story, too. It's too long for me to get into. Yeah, of course. It's a 20-minute story. Yeah, yeah. So see for... See, when you you then gave evidence and stuff, how was that decision? A man who was about the mafia, a man who could kill without losing any sleep, how was that an easy decision when you hear someone bad-mouthing you, or did it take time to then? No, it was the hardest decision of my life. How so? How so? It was the hardest decision of my life. I had a tremendous respect for Gozan Austria. I lived for it. I killed for it. I did everything for it. I rigged all his trials. When he got pinched, I threatened fucking jurors. I did a million things, paid them, paid them, did all kinds of things. How would you feel? You got, you're married? No. No? Well, if you were married and you had your wife and she was the fucking best thing in the fucking world for you and you did everything for her and she betrays you. Yeah, heartbroken. It's awful. So I was heartbroken at first. Mad, heartbroken, I was everything. Was people surprised when you... Start to give evidence. The FBI itself, when I reached out to them to talk, they didn't believe it. They said, Sammy's too hardcore. Uh, it's something's wrong. He's going to come in and he's going to fuck up the whole case, the trial. So he's going to do something. This is not him. All my life I've been arrested and I must have been asked to cooperate a hundred times in my life. I was on a double murder years ago in my Gumbada. They must have asked me a hundred times. I ain't never said yes. I always told them, get the fuck, take a walk. And they fought my cases or went to jail or whatever I did. But uh, it was the hardest decision of my life. What deal did they give you, Sammy? What? What deal did they give you? What deal did they I give you? I copped out that uh, in the deal that I would do no more than 20 years. And uh, I would have to, you know, give up my crimes and everything I knew. But my sentence would be no more than 20 years. And what did you do, five? Five. What prison did you do your five in? Well, some of them was in the, the MCC when I started. I did 11 months of it before I even cooperated. And then I went to uh, a prison in Texas, the Veloci Suite, they called it. The first guy who ever cooperated, they had a prison they made it itself for him and everything that place and I didn't want to stay there because I would have been the only guy there for years and years and years so I was bullshitting and breaking balls about it and then they sent me to witness units where I did time with other guys I wanted to be with other people see when you go to prison Sammy you end up in the witness protection is that correct when you're in the wet, wet psych unit, yeah. Yeah, so you, how long are you supposed to be in witness protection for? There's no limits. Because you've done eight months, you signed out. When I got out, I stayed in for eight months, and I quit. I didn't want to be any part of it. What was it like being in the system? In the system yeah. while you cooperate? Yeah. Well, you're in a wet psych while everybody in that unit uh, cooperated. Mm. Everybody. So the thing about you, Sammy, you've lived that life, you've killed people... You've done a lot of dark shit. You've cooperated. You've put one of the biggest bosses inside. But then you ended up doing an 18 stretch for ecstasy. See, when you came out, did you never just think, I'm going to change my life? Or was it just ingrained with in you to... I just... think the whole case was exaggerated. I, I really wanted to change my life. I got fucked up with this ecstasy case. Again, another long story. And, um, and I, uh, I pled out. 
he got 20 years. Because I think they were after your wife, your daughter, your son, mm -hmm. and you took the deal and done 20 years. I think that's why the story's confusing because you've turned on, go out, you know, to go to prison, but then you've done 20 years anyway, so it shows you your character. What you thinking then? What age were you? 60? No, I was, um, I believe I was, uh, I think I was 55 when I went back to prison. Did you ever think you would die in prison? Yeah, sure. Because I was already had that label of being a cooperator, being a rat or whatever. So I thought I'll never make it. How hard is that life on your kids, Sammy? Well, was, when I cooperated, it was super hard for my daughter and my son. And they got tangled up with this ecstasy bullshit. And I took a plea because I made a deal for them that they would not do. My son was facing 45 years with the feds and 25 years with the state. And when I made the deal, I copped out, didn't matter what time, um, that he only got 9.3 years, nine years, three months. And my daughter got no time, my wife got no time. So I took the weight, so to speak. And uh, I got 20 years. 20 years. Did they offer you another deal? No. But they just want you anyway because of the shit you done? Yeah, they wanted me uh, to take the weight on this case. There was a, a broad that was the attorney general. She was going to run for governor. She was pounding her chest that she got me. She was using that. They weren't giving me no deals. So they just wanted to uh, bragging rights. How were you treated in prison, Sammy, 18 years? Did you become a target? Or, again, was it that mindset of not manipulating, but you always seem to find a way? You always seem to find answers of surviving? Listen, a couple of times I got into a couple of battles in prison. A couple of times I heard some money in prison. Um... And I got along with inmates. I got along with them very well. And uh, I was friends with the ABs, the Aryan Brothers. I was very friendly with the Mexicans, our familia, very dangerous Mexican gang in prison. And I got along with people, basically. I never walked around like my shit don't stink. But they knew. I made it known. If you're going to fuck with me, you better kill me because I'm going to kill you. Simple as that. It's not going to be a fight. You're going to win the fight. You're going to kick me in the face. I'm going to kill you. So if you're going to, we're going to do it, that's, you better kill me. And they knew I would kill. I was a killer. So they kind of knew. He's not, he don't act like a, like a big shot. He doesn't do anything stupid and whatever. And, and uh, I was treated with respect in some cases. And when I wasn't, I reacted to it. Simple as that. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison? I don't know. I, prison's not a big deal to me. It, what's a big deal is you lose your fucking freedom. It's not what's happening in prison. I could deal with all those issues. It's outside. People die. You can't be part of your family. You can't help people. You can't do anything. And freedom is a big, big fucking thing. And at one point in that case, I went to the ADX Supermax. I started my that that bit, that 20 year bit. I did six and a half fucking years in a hole. The loneliness and is the worst thing I saw. Is living without, uh, I'm a people's person, living without people, family, things, is a little bit of a nightmare. It's, when I say a little bit of a nightmare, it's probably a lot more than a little bit of a nightmare. But starting the whole, uh, in the whole, I did you know time before that, where I was in population and stuff, but in the whole is a nightmare. What's your biggest regret in life, Sammy? 
I, I don't know. I answered this question and I get in trouble every, every time I answer this question because they take my words out of context. There's a lot of regrets. But when I look or think about my life, I say there's things I regret I don't like. There's things I do like. But every one of them left some sort of a mark on me. And it's what I am today. So if that didn't happen, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, what the fuck would I be today? I don't know. I'm happy about what I am today. I'm happy I can do what I'm doing in Hollywood. I've surrounded myself with legitimate good people. I'm doing this interview with you. Life is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, what would I be? Maybe I wouldn't do this. Maybe I wouldn't be doing this. Maybe I would be something else. I don't know what I would be. So it's hard to say to a person, you know, take out some of the things you did in life. And if they really think about it, they might say, then exactly what would I be today? I wouldn't be. I'm going to go to Anna who said she's a good person. But take out some of the things you have done or been or been through. Take them out. Would she be Anna now? Who is this person? I don't think so. You're obviously going to be a little different. Would I feel the same way about Anna as I feel now? If she was totally different? I don't know. Maybe not. So I don't know. It's a hard question to ask. It's it's a hard, harder uh, to answer it, to say, I don't know what I would be without those things happening. The, the Johnny Keys thing, it was devastating in my life. What would I have? What would happen if that didn't happen or I regret that happened? It never happened. Would I have been the, the, this dedicated to the mafia? Would I have been? I don't know what I would have been. I know what he taught me. He didn't talk to, you know, I regret that the guy died. I mean, I regret his, his family had to suffer. I regret those things. But what would I be, have been without that? I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I would have been a different person, I think. If you could change it, would you? The way I feel right now, what I am right now, no. Your life pass. No. 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 Because, yeah. I'm, because I wouldn't be Sammy the Bull right now. I wouldn't be in this conversation. I don't know what I would have been. Maybe I would have been a junkie. Fuck who I know. I don't know what I would have been. So I live by a certain guideline, and I know what I am now. I'm comfortable in this body. I'm very comfortable in this body. I know what I am. I'm good to a lot of people. And I brush off people. I don't kill people. I've changed my life. Some people say, you think you could? Yeah. Of course I could. I'm a fucking hit guy. I don't do it. And nobody's going to order me to kill anybody, so I ain't doing it. Do I want to do it on my own? Do I ever want to get up one morning and want to kill somebody? No. Am I argumentative? Ask the girls around me. I'm argumentative. Will I argue? Yeah. Will I fight right now? I'm 79. You look like a pretty hefty guy. You do something fucking crazy. I'm going to throw blows with you. I'll probably lose. You're a lot younger, strong, look stronger than me, but I'm going to go to blows with you. So I'm, I'm comfortable in what I am. What I would be without my prior life, with prior everything, you could say, what would you be without your mother and father? I, I have no idea. What would you be without Tato? I have no idea. I would have been a better man without Carmine Persico, I, you know, then maybe not. He was ruthless. Maybe he taught me what I don't want to be. But I had no choice, but you know what I'm saying? It's such a hard question to answer. In that life, Sammy, we speak about you being the perfect soldier, but when did the penny drop that every gangster either becomes murdered or in prison? Everybody's turning on each other. There's no loyalty. Bosses are being killed. Made guys are getting killed. 
when did the penny ever drop for you? Because you're a smart guy. You, you understood that life, but you understood your job and your duties, what it was to do. But what did the penny ever drop that it was all fucked up? It was only a matter of time before you were killed or in prison? When, it, you didn't, understood. it didn't happen. It, it happened in prison, but not for any of those reasons, not because of prison. When John Gotti turned on me, it was over. It was lights out. When I walked away, he wanted me to take the weight. He was going to back the tapes. He was going to have the lawyers back the tapes. On the tapes, I sound like a real bad dude. So they went to try and say, you heard the tapes. John's complained about Sammy. It's not poor John. It's him. It's Sammy. He's a monster. And when I said, are you sure that's what you want to happen? He said, I'm the boss. The boss has got to be on the street. You got to take the fall. I know it's wrong, but you got to take the fall. And when I walked away, I didn't say a word. When I walked away in my head, I said, fuck the mafia. Fuck John Gotti. I quit. I got in touch with the FBI. And that's just what I told them. I quit. I'm on your side now. I changed sides. Was there any man you feared in that life? In that life, just to say what I said and walked away is that I didn't know in the fuck the individuals that I told you a whole fucking mafia would want to kill you. And I knew that. So there's no individual I feared. John would put out an order to hit me. I mean, that's just, that happens. I mean, I feared nobody. Was there any times you actually wish you would have been killed? No. It might sound a weird question, but a lot of people are in pain and do a lot of dark shit with the hear screams and voices, have nightmares where they feel... Well, wish I would them. answer those people. Then go fuck up, jump off a bridge and go kill yourself. Don't live like a cunt. You're a cunt with that fucking bullshit answer. Go kill yourself. Don't wait for somebody else to kill you. You ain't got balls enough to kill yourself. You can give orders and you can kill people. You can't kill yourself. What's your problem? Put the fucking gun in your mouth and pull the trigger and get the fuck out of the way. No. I fear nothing. I fear nobody. Did you see a lot of suicides in the mafia? No, no, I really, uh, no. I didn't see too many suicides. I mean, I heard of a couple of guys, but they were, you know, not really mafiosos. No. No, I don't think there's that many guys. I've seen a lot of good, good people in the mafia. Not everybody's a killer. It's not a... They maybe could kill you or be part of it in some way, but they're not killers. They're not sadistic killers. And and I, if you would have left me alone and never gave me an order, I don't think I would have had two or three hits. Not 19. I would have been... Things I want to do on my own? I would have been down to a few. I wouldn't have never been close to 18. Greg Scarpa. He was a nutcase. I had Larry Mazzo on. He was saying he had over 100 kills or possibly over 200. But you grew up in the same street, is that correct? Yeah. Same neighbourhood. That's a fucking crazy street. That's a fuck. I would no fucking like to have grew up in that. It, you know, so, the whole neighbourhood, Bensonhurst, Dyker Heights, uh, Bay Ridge, um, Gravesend, that's all Benson, those areas. It was infested with mafiosos. It was crazy. There were so many murders where I had, a, we had a bar, Doc's Bar. It was in a commercial area. Trucks and everything are closed that night. There were dumb bodies there. I went around to people's clubs because I, every other fucking day there was a body. Not, I'm exaggerating every other day, but a lot. To the point, I said, the cops are going to think we're doing this. And I, a couple of my guys says, no, nah, they won't. Because if we did it, we wouldn't put them here. <laughs> it's our own block. We would put it somewhere else. So then you would realize that. But I went to people's clubs and said, listen, I, if you're killing, I don't give a fuck what you're doing. But if you're killing people, don't dump your fucking bodies over here. I got a club here. The cops are going to think I'm insane and killing fucking guys every three minutes over here. So... You know, and I, and I actually did that. Went around and talked to guys. And they said, they we laughed. And said, we're not dumping bodies over there. Now, somebody's dumping them. They're not mine. 
What's the best thing about being in the Mafia, Sammy? Brotherhood. The brotherhood. The families, like I said, you know, I may, you know, you're, you're a brother, you're a mafioso, you're my brother. I may I'm not like that guy. I may love the shit out of your wife. He's a good person. I like her. Not the banger, but I like her. Because banging her, you you die. That's a that's an old that's a, a you die, that's a death penalty. But I may like her as a person. She may be real good to my kids. Our ki- our families interact. So we become one gigantic fucking family. There's a lot of good things and a lot of good people in the mafia. What's the worst thing about being in the mafia? Is getting caught and go to jail and, and being all fucked up and and and, and murders uh, if if there was a way to possibly reduce the amount of, of things, but it, it, you can't. You have to have a. You're a killer. Your camera guy's a killer. I'm a killer. We, there has to be a a rule. If there's no rules, as you break a rule. You have to go. And if there's no rules or you don't go, then what stops me? Or what stops him? That Those murders stop other people who are tough. A guy like me, I would say, no, I'm going to do that. I'm going to break that rule. I'm going to die. Fuck that. I ain't doing that. Yeah. Why well, would you do that? Who was the maddest person you'd ever come across? Because you were mad. You were fucking off the scale nuts, even though you don't think so, but you were a killer, you were a fucking psycho, like, if we're honest, you know what I'm saying, but was there anybody that you thought, because no doubt you would have looked at people and says he's fucking crazy, but remember, 99.9% of this world will be thinking, you were a, you, you were a fucking, you were a nutcase, you were a fucking killer, but, is there anybody in your mind that you thought, yeah, he's he's a nutcase? Roy DeMeo, gas pipe, they're not nutcases, they became serial killers. Some people pass that mark of being a killer. It doesn't do anything to them. Some people pass that mark and they become a fucking serial killer. Now they're killing people for no reason. They enjoy killing. That's a serial killer. And those people, they're, like I said, Roy DeMeo, Gas Pipe, there's quite a few guys who became not quite a few, but there's a bunch who became serial killers. So see when you came out of prison after the ecstasy burst, what was life like then? What what you thinking coming out in your 70s? What were you thinking? I got out when I was 72 years old. I was fucking dead broke when I got out. I wasn't thinking anything. I lived in my daughter's house. I tried to get and I went for and I got Social Security that I paid taxes years ago, so I'm eligible. I got Social Security. I went down with my daughter. I couldn't get insurance because I was in so long. So I was a veteran. I went to the VA and got my veteran. Then I went for food stamps because I had no fucking money. Um, When I got out of prison, I had $430 to my name. When I got arrested, they took all my clothes and everything like that. They never gave them back. So I had no clothes, no money, no car, no phone. My kids bought me a phone. And little by little, I started coming back. And then my son said, nah, why don't you start doing, you got a lot of stories and shit, social media. And then I started doing social media after a while. Um, and one thing led to another, to another, to another. Um, my social media, um, I started with James Carroll. He heard me doing the stories. I asked him for a favor to help me. He did. And, uh, he said, you, we do these things. You're going to get 25 million views. I said, 25 million views. I was just away almost 20 fucking years. I said, I know 18 people for sure. <laughs> well, listen, I don't know about not 20 like me. And today we got 112 million views, almost 600,000 subscribers. And I got Hollywood. We're doing, we're going to do some movies. 
Why do you think people love true crime so much? I don't know. It's a big genre. It's, there's a lot of people doing it. A lot of women, believe it or not, and men like it. Women buy books because they give it to their husbands or their boyfriends. It's a big draw. It's one of the biggest. I think politics is one of the biggest. And crime stories of all you know, kinds. It could be black. It could be Hispanic. It could be bikers. It could be mom guys. It could be anything. But it's a big, big you know, draw um. for people. They love hearing the stories, listening to them. I think men all have a little bit of bad boy in them. Maybe they didn't go there. Maybe they don't want to go there. But they all, in their heart, would like to be a little bad boy every once in a while. The fancy cars, the money, good-looking broads. All the fucking doodads they see in movies, Goodfellas, Godfather. There's a lot of people who have that in them. And there's a lot of women who like bad boys. Yeah. They like people who are men. Like we were talking about being a man, live like a man, act like a man. You don't have to be a gangster or a killer. But they like men to be men. And they like bad boys. Uh -huh. You know, so they read about it. They fantasize about it, maybe. You know, I don't know. But it is it is a big, you know, fact yeah. that this is a big area of it. There's a lot of podcasts all over the, all over the world has an interest in this. I mean, we do a Q&A, we get 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 people. Some of the countries that, that come on my life. It's crazy. I mean, I get England, Israel, all c countries from all Africa. I mean, I, 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 how many people in Africa will listen to me? Uh, uh, it's crazy. What is all your social? Road rush. Is all your socials and your YouTube for people, for my followers to come over and have a look? They'll know you who you are anyway, but what is your YouTube and your Instagram and stuff? Salvatore Samurai Bill Gravano is your YouTuber uh, for people to go and subscribe. Then I have another one. I have my own uh, website now, uh, ourthing.tv, and we're putting stuff out on that, and people are joining. So I got followers like from all uh, from all over the world. Did you ever think that would happen, no, Sammy? No, no, no. Maybe, like I said, when I was talking with James Carroll, he told me twenty five million. I, 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 I just I didn't want to laugh at his face, but I just I, I said I got family and friends. I think I'm mean, for sure I could get 18 people to listen to me, yeah. maybe. How is that when you listen? I'm all for people coming out and changing. It's a noble thing to do, no matter what you've done in life. Anybody that, because making changes is the fucking hardest thing on this planet to do. And when you do it, people laugh. People try and try and bring you down. This is a fucking sad My world we're in. How is that coming out of prison? a hitman, a known fucking nutcase, to then be on YouTube and other gangsters on YouTube and everybody kind of want to do this now. How do you see that now? Because it would never, never have happened 20, 30 years ago. Nobody would have speak. It's like you say, the mafia is a, it's a secret society. It's a, right. it's a fucking brotherhood. You keep your mouth shut, do your job, and just nobody knows nothing. But nowadays, the, for me anyway, the police know everything. But nowadays, everything's out there. Everybody right. knows everything. How is that when you see other gangsters, so-called hitmen, well, doing this? Let me question. Now. Yeah. It, it, you just hit the nail on the head. It's a secret society, a brotherhood, do your job, quiet, go away. Right? So what do you think of John Gotti with all that flashy fucking shit? It's crazy. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. It's it beyond, just attention, it's yeah. beyond words crazy. Yeah. It's, you, you just exposed every fucking thing to the whole world. You told everybody, I'm a gangster. Here I am. With all my suits and ties and shirts and this and Mercedes Benz and my hair combed perfect, everything's perfect. I mean, so, you know, that that was insane. I, You know, if it happens to some people, they get starstruck. I think he fell in love with himself. I think he forgot he was a boss and he started thinking he was a movie star. Right now, if he was alive and you were able to ask him, what would you want to be? He would probably tell you, I want to be Sammy on fucking YouTube with all them followers and I want to do some <laughs> movies and I want to do X, Y, Z. It's crazy. And you're right. There's gangsters up the wazoo all over YouTube. Matter of fact, it's getting so stupid that they're just bad-mounting each other like, you know, 
I got guys ripping it. He's lying. He's doing this. He's doing that. I two or three of them that they can't get views unless they mention my name. And they get jealous, like, oh my God, he's got you know that that many. One they want to get views and they want to use your name. It's got to the point that it's crazy, you know. And um, I'd hate to shut it down. It annoys me sometimes. I hate to shut it down after working this hard to get it to this point and do what I'm doing. So I don't think I'm going to shut it down. But sometimes it makes me like, let me get the fuck out of this. It's like a cesspool wheel. Yeah. You know? So, but uh, I then I always change my mind. You know, it took people to get me here. It took my team. And I mean, my son, my daughter, people who helped me. My ex-wife who supports me in certain things. Friends, some of my old friends that I go back 30, 40, 50 years with are supportive. And I almost feel like I'm not trapped, but I'm obligated to them. Too far gone. Yeah, it's too far gone. I'll stay with it, bro. Yeah. Until the day I die. You know, somebody, when I come in the office one day, maybe I'll be laying on the floor, and that's the end of my story. And uh, and when... They could keep going with it. They'll write books about it. They'll do YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be doing yeah, videos yeah, about yeah, it. A good episode. Yeah, getting views from people's misery. <laughs> Just before we finish up, Sammy, for anybody who's struggling in life, for anybody who's battling, whether it's addiction, mental health, for maybe wanting to get involved in life or crime, what advice would you have for them? You know, I, I, all I would say is, like, get the, the few uh, few questions. Life for crime, life for crime. You got to remember, you're going to give up your freedom. You're going to give up a lot for these things. As far as going ahead with your life, hard work, I'm killing myself, hard work. It's not easy. I work hard seven days a week. I don't know how many hours a day, but a lot, a lot more than an eight-hour day. Um, sometimes I think I had the day off when I work eight hours. But work hard, go ahead, have a great family. Have a great life. You've got so many things to look forward to. And uh, if you're failing at something, don't get disappointed. Go back in business again. Keep going because now when you fail, you go back. You're going back with experience. You know what everything you've done wrong. So now you're educated. You have that experience. Go forward. Just keep going with your life and your family. Um it's the most important thing. You only got one life to live. Uh -huh. You know, don't just waste your time and uh, I can't do it. I, d don't stop with excuses. Do it. I can't uh, sing. I don't sing. I try. I, I work on this social media. I, I said I can't do it. I do it. I mean, I'm going to do movies. I can't do it. I do it. Just do it. Try. If you don't make it, at least you could say, I tried. You know, so. Just keep showing up. How is it going over your story? Because you must have said that a fucking thousand times, but does it bring back a lot of emotions? And does it drain you when you talk about your story? Some some of the stories, yeah. The Johnny Keys, there's a lot of stories. I grew up, like I said, with Louis Molito. Some of my crew I had to take out for reasons. that They became crackheads and, you know, I wish that they could uh, have changed their lives and went in the right direction and still be alive. But certain things just don't happen. You can't, especially death. Once it happens, you can't change it. You know, Paul Castellano told me one time, you pull the trigger, boom. The bullet comes out of the gun. You can't stop it in midair no more. It's going to hit its target and do its damage. A bow and arrow. You pull the bow, you let it go, you're not going to stop that in midair no more. It's going to go where it's got to go and do damage. Things you say with your mouth is the same as the bullet and the bow and arrow. It'll come out, you can't stop it no more, it'll go to that person, and it'll do damage. So watch what you do and say. And uh, conduct your life. When you're hot, you want to say something to your wife or your kid or your friend, bite your tongue a little bit. Watch what you say. Just as deadly as the gun or the bow and arrow. 
So, you know, and that was a, a, a bit of advice I got, and I, and I understand that. Sometimes I bite my tongue. Sometimes I say, I wish I could take that back. But you can't. Uh-huh. We shared, just last question, Sammy. What's the biggest life lesson that you've learned your 79 years on this planet? A life lesson, like I said before about regrets, be, be you. Be true blue to you. If you can look at yourself in the mirror after whatever you did and give yourself a nod, then just be you. You know, there's so many things that looking in the mirror, uh, I wouldn't do certain things because I can't. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror. I could lie, I could bullshit, but I can't look at myself in the mirror with certain things. So just be you. Get comfortable in your skin. God made lions and they made lambs. Don't be all fucked up if you're a lion or a lamb. He made you. You had free will. He'll understand you. Don't worry about it. Don't listen to everybody. If you're a lion, be a lion. Try and, you know, there, there's another saying that, you know, you have two wolves, a wolf on the left, or a lion on the left side. I have a lion on my left and a lamb on my right. Which one comes at you? Which one wins? It's the one you feed. You feed the lion, he's going to be biting people. When there's a problem, you get mad, start feeding this one. So this one wins the argument and calms you the fuck down. You don't always have to be a lion. But some places, the lion's important. God gave you that free will, gave you those options. Live, be true to yourself. Sammy, listen, for giving me your time, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. Would you like to finish up on anything else? No, no, I'm good. I enjoyed the the, the interview. You were a great interviewer, and uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I know you've told your story, but it's just for the audience, we've got to go over some questions that you've been asked many times before. But again, I wish you nothing but the best for the future. God bless you, and keep doing what you're doing. My mate. Thank you, Sammy.